Hello everyone, welcome to Organic One Lab CH4511. Uh, this will be the pre-lab video for TLC of benzene derivatives and analgesics. All right, and so um, some of some important things to uh, talk about here. Um, you will be working with a plethora, a lot of different molecules, but there are quite a few. There's one big similarity between all of these molecules. Um, so when you go and you actually look up these molecules for your safety and data, uh, your safety chart, um, especially looking at stuff like benzoic acid, caffeine, acetaminophen, um, benzaldehyde, benzyl alcohol, methyl benzoate, acetosalicylic acid, and ibuprofen, and benzamide down here, all of these have a benzene ring as a part of their structure. So they all are unified in that same regard. Now, one of the things that that's kind of important uh, in terms of talking about here, um, you also see the materials that you're going to have as a benzene light. All right, and so you're actually going to be using, not benzene light, a UV light. You're going to be using this UV light in order to actually tell you where components have moved along a plate. All right, and so in essence, you're going to be seeing, um, and I'm, I'm jumping the gun a little, a little bit here, but in essence, you're going to be seeing something along the lines of, you'll have a little plate, okay, a little TLC plate like this, and then you're going to put one, two, three, however many, it varies. Um, you actually have three different plates you're going to be working with, but um, you are going to put spots on there and then you're going to take this and you're going to put it in a TLC chamber it's just a big jar okay and it's going to have solvent in it all right and you want to make sure that the solvent pretty much just touches the plate it doesn't actually touch your compound so this would be like compound A compound B compound C I'm just giving some way to describe them all right and what you're going to see is over time the solvent front this solvent right here will actually begin to migrate up the plate all right up to some point you want to stop it usually somewhere two to three centimeters before it reaches the very top of the plate so then you're going to have your solvent front where it stops and the thing is you're not actually going to be able to see these compounds migrate up with the solvent front Okay, um, and the way you're going to visualize that is you're going to be using the UV light. And what's going to wind up happening is when you take your plate, it's pretty much just going to look something like that, where you've drawn the starting line, you've drawn the finishing line, the solvent front line, and then when you put it under a UV light, you're just, okay, so before the UV light, you're just going to see this blank kind of plate. And then when you put it under the UV light, what you're going to see is this whole entire plate is going to fluoresce green. It's, and there's going to be these certain little spots, right? There's going to be these little spots, like one, two, and three here, that do not show up any color whatsoever. And these are where your benzene are. I'm just saying are. They all have benzene as that makes them the in common and so but what happens is the benzene ring will actually absorb that UV light so you, that's why you won't see fluorescence here because it's absorbing the light and it's not exciting the plate but anyway so that's one key important factor there okay now <clears throat> um, Another thing you want to do is you do want to make sure that you go and you look through the chromatography tutorial that's in the appendix okay um, now what your one of the big overall goals here is you need to uh, practice, right, in part one, hang on, you need to practice with some known compounds, right? You're going to be working with five specific benzene derivatives, benzoic acid, benzaldehyde, benzyl alcohol, methyl benzoate, um, and benzamide. Right, and so all of these have a have a benzene ring, and there's just one slight modification to their functional group. All right, and so you're going to see how they uh, migrate along the TLC plate. All right, and then with that, you're going to need to be able to look at the solvent front, so the distance that the solvent traveled, the distance that each compound traveled, and then from there you're going to need to calculate what's called the RF value or the retention factor for those five compounds. All right, and we'll talk more about that in a second.
In part two, you're going to do you're going to work with two different TLC plates. In the first one, you're going to work with just known compounds, known drugs, caffeine, acetylsalicylic acid, acetaminophen, and ibuprofen. All right. Then in the the other, the third TLC plate, um, you're going to have two unknowns labeled as unknown A and unknown B. Uh, sitting alongside a reference solution and so you're gonna run three spots on the third one okay um, and what it is you're trying to identify what those two unknowns are based off of the reference because the reference has all four of these in it okay and so you're gonna notice some similarities there and then you're gonna need to come back up here to this table right because each one of these drugs has uh, each one of these specific name brands has th these combination of drugs in them. So you'll notice here, uh, Anison has both aspirin and caffeine, while something like Excedrin has three different drugs, acetaminophen, aspirin, and caffeine. All right, um, and then while some of the others, uh, Bufferin just has aspirin, Tylenol just has acetaminophen, or it is acetaminophen, and then Advil is just ibuprofen. Okay, but then some of these others can be more uh, elaborate. Okay, so then, and that's what you need to be able to identify. Okay, um, now, um, what we're going to be seeing from there, you want to, you need to jump down to the uh, chromatography tutorial. Okay, now in this, this talks so the this chromatography t tutorial does talk a lot about chromatography overall so you know you could so there are specific techniques that are used like paper chromatography TLC which is what you're using for this experiment thin layer chromatography uh, GC which is an experiment you'll be do you'll use uh, GC later for um, you have column chromatography other types of more specific types of column chromatography uh, could be like HPLC, so high pressure liquid chromatography, and then something generic like liquid chromatography. So you have all of these big distinctions, and, and there's an extra one in there. There's uh, UHPLC now, um, ultra high pressure. Um, but anyway, so there are always chromatography is great for separations, right? That's really what we're talking about here, right? All of these chromatography techniques separate co compounds or components. All right, um, and these are based off phase distributions, right? You have two phases in chromatography. You have a mobile phase, and then you have a uh, stationary phase, all right? So it uses a stationary phase and a mobile phase. And so a lot of what winds up happening here, you're actually going to be looking at something as simple as the polarity of your compounds, right? So nonpolar compounds are soluble in organic solvents, right? while polar compounds are uh, soluble in aqueous solvents, right? And so a lot of what you're seeing here is uh, the stationary phase in TLC is silica, right? While the mobile phase is something like hexane, right? So you're looking at a polar stationary phase and a nonpolar mobile phase, all right? And so in those regards, uh, like stays with like. So in a mobile phase, nonpolar compounds are going to stay with the solvent, while polar compounds are going to try and stay on the stationary phase. So kind of talking about just some random generic example, if you were to look at, say, two compounds, right? I'm going to make, make up a fake TLC plate here, all right? I have two compounds, compound A, compound B. Now, compound A is something very polar, like this thing that has two alcohol groups on it, right? Versus compound B, which has uh, no polarity whatsoever. So let's say it's something like cyclohexane, okay? I'm just making something up on the fly. There's not a lot of accuracy here in terms of what was going to happen. All right, but let's say we know that the stationary phase is composed of silica, right? So that's, you see a lot of uh, silica oxide bonds in there, okay? So that oxygen means that this stationary phase is very polar, 
Okay. So what does that mean? That means that when we look at these two molecules, this molecule is very polar. So it's going to like to stay at the stationary phase. All right. So A, over time, we won't really see it move that much, while B here is very nonpolar. So if our mobile phase is something like hexane, one, two, three, four, five, six. It's something like hexane, right? Both of these are nonpolar. So this is going to move with the mobile phase. So B is going to be all the way up here, while A will barely have moved over time. All right, and so that's what we're talking about, how these polarities can help us evaluate how far a given molecule travels um, in regards to TLC. Okay, now when we start talking about other types of chromatography, like uh, high pressure, uh, and column chromatography, the it gets a little more complicated because your columns um, can easily be changed out based off of different chemical principles. So, but for TLC, just think polarities is what allows us to tell us what should move a, a larger distance compared to something else. All right. Now, one way that we can talk about that would be using the partition coefficient here, which K, right? Partition coefficient. This partition coefficient. Uh, shows us the concentration in the stationary phase uh, versus the concentration in the mobile phase at the bottom. So that's what the S and the M stand for. All right. <clears throat> so what we would expect to see over time is um, if a solvent, or sorry, if a compound uh, it stays in the stationary phase, you're going to have a big number on top, right? So the partition coefficient would be large. However, if it stays in the mobile phase, it keeps traveling up, then you're going to see a very small partition coefficient. CS stands for stationary phase, CM stands for mobile phase. All right, so if we have a molecule that doesn't want to stick to the stationary phase, CS here, right, then we're going to see it mostly stay in the mobile phase. So it's going to travel all the way up the plate. Okay, so like for instance, when we go back to my analogy here, right, we look at A versus B. If I were to talk about the, the partition coefficient here, right, it's CS over CM. Would we expect K to be a large number or a very small number? Well, remember, it's concentration of B in the stationary phase versus the concentration of B in the mobile phase. So when you look at that, you have very little... in the stationary phase and you have a lot in the mobile phase, right? So you have a small number divided by a big number. So your partition coefficient here is very small. While this one here has a very large part uh, partition coefficient because it's wanting to stay in the stationary phase, right? And not in the mobile phase. So this, so K here would be very big, right? Big daddy. And then this one would be Little tiny Tim, my please sir, I want some more. All right, and so um, anyway, so that's what we would see for those partition coefficients. All right, now there's other ways that we can talk about the efficiency of or how efficient type different types of chromatography are. Uh, they use this thing called theoretical plates, and literally, it's in the name theoretical. Right, this is kind of a made up number, but it's made up based off of observed events okay so it's not like they're just throwing a number out there but um if you if you see something that has a large number of theoretical plates that means that it's very good at separating components right individual components right but it, and if it has a very small number of theoretical plates then it's so-so right because tlc it's it's an adequate separation technique but it actually has a very small theoretical plate count like it's theoretical plate count somewhere somewhere around a thousand but um, if you talk about uh, HPLC a lot of the columns that you use to separate they have theoretical plate counts of like 10,000 so 300 10,000 which one's going to be more efficient all right um, <clears throat> and then uh, there is a lot in here that talks about uh, GC but one of the things you kind of want to pay attention to is retention time and retention factor. Um, and so if you look here down at the bottom, there, uh, there is a discussion on RF, the retention factor. And so really all that is, it's based off of 
how far the molecule traveled divided by how far the solvent traveled. So when you look at this representation of a TLC plate, right, you would start like this, you'd have your plate, you'd have the starting line, and then you would have each one of your individual components. Then you would put it in the chamber, hit it with the UV, and you would say, oh look, there's where my three spots moved. So you, would, you could actually calculate the retention factor for compound C, compound A, and compound U. So in order to get it, say, for compound U here, you would take this distance, you would go from here to here, the middle of the dot, and you would measure that with a ruler. Then you would take that distance and divide it by the distance traveled by the solvent. So what is the distance from here to here, right, using a ruler? And that's it. Now, one of the big things here is you have to notice right can a compound move farther than the solvent front hopefully you automatically recognize that answer as no right so for instance what I'm really asking you here is if I give you a mock demonstration of a TLC plate right if we start here and our solvent moves to here now what I'm asking you is can a compound move farther than the solvent. So could I see a compound dot all the way up here? No, right? It couldn't have started here and then went all the way there past the solvent front. Right? It couldn't have done that, right? Because the molecule needs the solvent. It travels with the solvent, right? It's not going to teleport on the plate, okay? Only electrons can teleport. You don't believe me? Look up nodes. Anyway, so... <clears throat> um. With that being said, if your retention factor is going to be the distance the compound moved divided by the distance that the solvent traveled, that tells you one important thing. Your retention factors can never be larger than one, okay, because no molecule can move farther than the solvent, right? This is always your bigger number on the bottom. Your retention factor can never be larger than one. Okay. All right. Uh, with that, you should be prepared um, as long as you've gone through both the tutorial and the experiment uh, within the manual. You should be prepared for your pre-lab quiz. Good luck.